and good afternoon. It is noon and today is our regular lunch and learn. Now today we're going to be talking about uh, gut bacteria and how gut bacteria affects your risk of colon cancer. So I know that colon cancer and you probably know this too, colon cancer is on the rise and it is something that you know the doctors tell us to go and get a colonoscopy every however many years after you turn 50 i think it might now be 40 because your gut bacteria is is a problem uh, i think it's a problem because of the foods that we eat and uh, the non-foods that we eat okay the package is foods they tell you it's foods but if you look at all the ingredients it is nothing but synthetic ingredients which all has to do with keeping our gut bacteria in check. So this is an article and it says that if you can regulate your gut bacteria, then you can cut your risk of colon cancer quite significantly. So there are a growing number of studies that have shown that gut bacteria have a significant impact on the development of colorectal cancer, the third most common cause of cancer here in the United States, okay? Uh, so how do we cultivate good gut bacteria? Well, I'm glad you asked because we're going to tell you how to do that. Everything that we eat does something to our gut bacteria. Now, you have trillions and trillions of microbiome in your gut, okay? it is The living environment is called your microbiome, but it's microbiota that is in there. It's bacteria. Uh, you were born with it, especially if you're vaginally birthed, then you got a good dose of it as you went through the birth canal. So thank you, mom. Um, if you have ever had any kind of antibiotics, and we all have had antibiotics from time to time, it kills the bad bacteria that's bothering us, but it also kills the good bacteria that we need to keep us healthy. All right. If we live off of a diet of soda and candy and processed food, stress and that kind of thing, you further kill your good bacteria. And it is the good bacteria that keeps the bad guys in check. Otherwise, we have all kinds of problems. So as my perspective that we never need antibiotics, no, that's not my perspective. My perspective is if we do need antibiotics, then we need to be taking a good probiotic at the same time in a spore form, okay? In a spore form, it travels through the digestive tract. It goes through the um, stomach acid, the hydrochloric acid in the stomach, and it repopulates in the large intestine where it is supposed to do that. Okay. So the study says that gut bacteria is closely related to colorectal cancer. We are told all the time if you are gen that you are genetically predisposed, but this report says that the genetic factor only accounts for 12 to 35 percent of one's risks of developing colon cancer. So the impact of your environment is very much greater. The impact of the Western diet and lifestyle on the gut microbiome can increase one's risk. And oral hygiene is another risk factor. So we're going to talk about that in a moment. So the gut microbiome of patients with colorectal cancer is different from healthy people. So this is really, really important. What we want to do is we want to reintroduce the good bacteria into our guts so that our gut microflora is the way it is supposed to be and not overrun with the bad guys. Okay. One study found that the stool and tumor samples from patients with colorectal cancer tend to have more E. coli bacterial, more uh, strep bacteria, and more enterococcus bacteria than anybody else. So what is E. coli? We all have E. coli in the large intestine. We just do. So what's happening is people with colorectal cancer have an overgrowth of that. And so what we need to do is find out how can we not have an overgrowth of the bad bacteria and have an overgrowth of the good bacteria, which keeps the bad bacteria in check. So the E. coli is a diverse group of bacteria. Okay. Most of the bacteria is harmless, but some are pathogenic. The American uh, Journal of Clinical Investigations pointed out that E. coli is positively 
uh, associated with colorectal cancer at about 60% detection rate in colorectal cancer patients and approximately only 20% in healthy people. So that's a big, diverse number, okay? So if you are overrun with E. coli, your chances of getting colorectal cancer is increased. In addition, many bacteria in the fecal matter of patients with colorectal cancer are related to the oral commensural bacteria, all right? A large-scale study showed that women with low tooth count and moderate to severe periodontal disease have a 48% increase in colorectal cancer. So that's really, really important because what we use in our mouth is really important with the bacteria that we have in our mouth. Now we all have bacteria in our mouth. Everybody knows that. What you want to do or what you don't necessarily want to do is overdo mouthwash and overdo um, they, they've got these preparations that you, you take in your mouth and that kind of thing. And what it does is it kills your good bacteria. Yes, it kills the bad breath bacteria, but it also kills your good bacteria. So the study linked negative bacteria in your mouth to negative bacteria in your fecal matter. Now, I don't know who the scientists are that like to dig through fecal matter. I'm just glad that's not my job, right? And so but we need to know this. We go to a biological dentist and the biological dentist, you know, does all the swabs and we'll look at the bacteria that we have in our mouth and he will tell us if it's good or if it's bad and what we need to do and that kind of thing, which is really, really important. If you have periodontal disease, then you definitely are going to have some bacterial issues and that's not good as relates to colorectal cancer. Now, there is a doctor and I'm going to say his last name is Sai. It's spelled T-S-A-I, okay, who is an expert in probiotics in Asia and is a professor at the National Yang Ming Tung University in Taiwan. Okay, forgive me for mispronouncing all of that. He pointed out that all of the studies that use comparative methods to compare the differences in gut microbiome between healthy patients and patients with colorectal cancer, says the scientific community does not understand exactly how the bacteria affects the colorectal cancer. The current most accepted theory is that the bad bacteria disrupts the microbiome and releases toxicity that affects cell regulation or directly damages those cells, all right? So cell regulation, when you have a cell, you've got programmed cell death in the cell. That means the cell is going to live, multiply, divide, multiply, divide until it, it kind of exhausts all of its energy. And when that happens, there is a constituent in the cell that says, okay, you've lived out all your usefulness. You need to die. We need to have new stuff. So that is cell regulation. Cancer is an unregulated cell. It does not have programmed cell death, apoptosis is the medical word for it. It does not have that in there. And so those cells are immortal. And that's why cancer grows and grows and grows. That's why if you ever have cancer, you are never, ever cancer free because you always will have cancer stem cells circulating in your body. All right. So don't get too wigged out over that, even though that's not great, great news. Right. If we keep our immune system doing what our immune system do, then the immune system is programmed to go after those cells and destroy those cells with uh, phagocytes, macrophages, all those kind of things that we all have in our body. So the thought is with the scientists that the good bacteria keeps your cell regulation doing what it needs to do. The bad bacteria disrupts that cell regulation. They also produce toxic metabolites, which cause chronic inflammation and a change in intestinal permeability. All right, these changes affect the mucosal cells of the large intestine and cumulative damage can lead to abnormal cell proliferation, no programmed cell death, okay? And all of this will result in colon cancer. So we want to make sure that we are doing everything that we can do to stop that. Now, when you have intestinal permeability, 
Okay, let me back up. So from your mouth all the way down to your bottom, right, you have a mucus, gastrointestinal mucus too. All right, that's how your food gets from your mouth all the way down to the potty, okay? So the foods that we eat, the fungus that we have, the chemicals that we take in, the synthetic things that we take in, eat away at that mucus lining in the GI tract. That's how we get ulcers. That's how we get leaky gut syndrome. That's how we get small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, SIBO. That's how we get uh, H. pylori, all those kind of things that disrupt the gut microbiome. So we need to be very, very intentional with our food and with our supplements that we get the kind of supplements that are good for us and that it will repair that uh, GI tract mucosa lining, okay? So when you have, think of this as scales, okay? If my gut lining is really, really tight, it's tight. If I've got permeability, you've got gaps. When we've got gaps, we've got those foods that we eat, those proteins that our body makes goes through that lining and the body, the immune system recognizes that as a foreign body, it sets up inflammation. Inflammation is a good thing. Chronic inflammation is not a good thing, okay? So inflammation is your, your immune system going, hey, we've got an invader. We've got somebody who we don't know what it is, and so we need to go attack, attack, attack. And that's what our immune system is supposed to do. But when it is ongoing, constant, 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 then we get that chronic inflammatory response, and that's where cancer sets up. That's where autoimmune disease sets up. And so we don't want to do that. So we need to understand that inflammation is a good thing. It is the body's response to an invader, but chronic inflammation is not a good thing. So the way the body is designed, we've, we've got something, we're going to say me, I go out and I eat at XYZ restaurant. Okay. I get something bad. I eat it. I don't know it's bad. My body goes, yikes, this is something that's poison. We don't need that. So what's going to happen? I'm going to instantly have an inflammatory response. I'm going to have diarrhea. I'm going to be throwing up. I may be doing it, you know, all at the same time. But that is my body going, get this out of her. That is an inflammatory response. So I'm going to lay on the floor and be passed out because I'm absolutely exhausted from all that clean out. But I'm going to live another day. And the inflammation is just going to go shh because the danger is past, right? When our joints on our mucosal lining are not tight and they're open, we are constantly getting those proteins from the food that we eat and whatever else that we're ingesting into the bloodstream, which creates that chronic inflammation. And that chronic inflammation sets us up for sickness and disease. And so we don't want to do that. So... Another component that we have in our bodies, and this is a good thing, but it has to be kept in check, okay, is the butyrite, okay? Butyrite is an um, essential fatty acid that helps us digest our food. But if it is in the wrong concentration, then it can have some problems. So I'm going to read you this little bit of a report here. It says that the association between gut bacteria and colorectal cancer is this secretion of the bacterial metabolite butyrate by the bacteria, which can induce cell aging and inflammation and promote tumor formation. Paradoxically, however, the short chain fatty acids produced by the gut bacteria when they are fermenting the dairy, uh, sorry, dietary fiber, especially butyrate, have been found to balance the gut microbiota and maintain the mucosal barrier, modulate the host immune response and prevent infection, regulate energy expenditure. Therefore, butyrate producing bacteria are considered probiotics. All right. So the doctor, Dr. Sai, emphasizes that every kind of bacteria will produce butyrate to some extent. The bad bacteria will also produce it, and the harm of the bad bacteria mainly comes from the toxins that they produce. So, 
in a nutshell, what that means is we have to keep the good guys replenished all the time because the good guys squash the bad guys. Now, I know nobody has a degree in biology. Well, most of us don't, me included. I took biology. I studied biology. But, you know, that's give you a little um, visual aid here. So when we're born, right, vaginally birthed, we breastfeed, right? Yay, probiotics. So when we do that, we have 80% good bacteria, 20% bad bacteria. Stress, bad food, um, E. coli, uh, synthetic things, pharmaceuticals, uh, chlorine in the water, changes that gut bacteria balance. So now I've got 80% bad guys and only 20% good guys. So what I have to do is do something to get it back like this because the good guys will keep the bad guys at bay, okay? You're always going to have bad bacteria because that's part of the natural function of the gut. That's part of the natural function of taking your food, digesting your food, absorbing the nutrition from your food. You've got those toxic metabolites. But if you've got that good flora, then you're going to keep that bad bacteria at bay. And this is what we're finding with people who have colon cancer is they've got it reversed, and so that bad bacteria is what is killing them, okay? So does that help? I hope that does help you, okay? So the appropriate concentration of butyrite is beneficial to the human body, but it's harmful when it gets too high. And the problem is that no one knows the true cutoff value between a positive response and a negative response. Stem cells also can renew and differentiate, and they proliferate into the same type of cells or differentiate into cells with differing functions. We know that. The growth of intestinal cells is derived from the differentiation of stem cells. A stem cell is like a master cell. It can be whatever you body needs it to be. And so you're, it's, it's like a... Um, it's a cell, but it doesn't have an identity. Whatever your body needs it to become, your body says, okay, cell, I need you to become a XYZ cell. And the stem cell goes, oh, gotcha. I'm going to do that. I'm going to differentiate. I'm going to become that cell. Okay, that's how stem cells work. We all have stem cells. That's how children grow is their stem cells are doing what they need to do. Now, as older people, we have less stem cells and the stem cells that we have are tired and so that's why we have to keep our frequencies high so that we can keep turning over and reproducing and healing and repairing and all that kind of thing so um, stem cells promote normal cell growth the normal cells in turn protect the stem cells from the butyrate okay nobody really understands how that works but the state of your gut health is very important for all of those things working out the way they need to. Butyrate is harmful if the intestinal tract is in a state of severe ulceration. So think of irritable bowel syndrome, think of Crohn's disease, think of ulcerative colitis. Okay, hopefully none of you have that. We see that a lot here in the clinic and we have great programs that reverse that. And uh, one of my, my most favorite stories is of a gentleman that came in and he had ulcerative colitis so badly that he was bleeding from the rectum. And we worked with him. We worked with him for two years. He went back for a colonoscopy and he told his wife, he said, there is absolutely no ulcers. There's absolutely no scar tissue. If I did not know this man, I would say that he had never, ever had ulcers in his colon. So the body knows how to repair that. So if that's you or someone you know, then they need to come in because we can help with that, okay? But the people that have these conditions are the ones most uh, susceptible to having colorectal cancer, okay? This view has been widely accepted uh, for recent years, okay? So how do we regulate our gut bacteria? I'm so glad you asked, okay? So does reducing the bad bacteria in the body lower the risk of colorectal cancer? So this Dr. Yang, who is the former chief physician in the Department of Infectious Disease in Taipei, 
uh, General Hospital pointed out that the microbiota of the digestive tract are in a state of dynamic balance with the human body. Various microorganisms of the internal environment form a complex ecosystem. Trying to get rid of certain bad bacteria from the body won't necessarily lead to a good outcome as it affects the whole system. So it isn't a good idea to prevent certain types of bacteria from entering the body because those bacteria have beneficial effects on the body. He says that the fundamental solution is to maintain the micro ecosystem of the body, which includes eating a healthy diet, getting the right and enough exercise, preserving good mental health, sticking to a regular sleep schedule, practicing good oral hygiene, and controlling chronic diseases such as high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and high blood sugar. So that's a mouthful, right? And so it's just as we said at the beginning of the program that we need to make sure that we've got that 80-20 in the good side. The 80% is your good bacteria. The, the bad side is your 20%. And if you keep that in check, then the bacteria is going to do what it is supposed to do without having negative effects. And the good bacteria is going to keep everything moving in the right direction. Now, what kills your good bacteria? Let me tell you again. Antibiotics, overuse of antibiotics. And if you say, oh, Dr. Polly, I haven't had antibiotics in 10 years. Yeah, me neither. I haven't had antibiotics a long, long time, long, long time. However, if we eat commercial dairy, if we eat commercial meat, commercial chicken, they're all infused with antibiotics and hormones. So you may not be taking antibiotics from your doctor, but you're taking antibiotics when you eat industrial processed meats, dairy, and poultry. So make sure that you get natural, make sure that your package says no antibiotics because it's those antibiotics that kill your good flora. Stress kills your good flora. Chlorine in your water kills your good flora. So, oh, but Dr. Polly, I drink, I drink bottled water, da, 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 da. Okay, fine, but you probably bathe in chlorinated water. You probably bathe uh, or shower in the municipal water, whatever you get. Thank God it's clean water and I'm all over that. However, the chlorine will kill your good bacteria. So you want to make sure that you've got your good bacteria in the right way. So modulating the gut microbiome is a powerful tool in colorectal cancer prevention. And there are specific methods to do this. Number one, change your diet. All right. Change your diet. The best diet for keeping your microbiota in the right way is the Mediterranean diet. All right. You can Google it. You can see what it is. It is a very, very good diet. Several studies have shown that excessive intake of red meat and processed meats may increase the risk of developing colorectal cancer. When the diet residues entering the colon are mainly protein residues, the bile acids secreted by the liver to digest fat may cause damage to the colon cells through pro-inflammatory uh, responses. Now, I just want to add a little caveat to that because I'm a Texas girl and I love my steak, okay? And I'm not going to quit. I'm just, I'm not going to quit eating steak. But what I do as I make sure that I take digestive enzymes with every meal so that there is no residue uh, through the system. All of my food is broken down. All of my nutrients are absorbed. And so whatever goes through the large intestine is truly just waste products. Now, know your number, right? I've got my little bracelet. Know your number. We have this little scanner. We test you to see if you are absorbing your nutrition. Most people are not absorbing their nutrition. And so if you are over 30 and you have eaten the standard American diet, remember we call it the SAD diet, right? If you've eaten the standard American diet, then you probably have exhausted all of the enzymes that your pancreas has. So you need to have enzyme therapy. How do you know if you need enzyme therapy? Well, I'm gonna tell you. When you go to the bathroom, 
you, number two, you go to the bathroom, right? If you're eating two to three meals a day, then you should be moving your bowels two to three times a day the next day, right? We want an 18 to 24 hour bowel transit time from the time it goes in your mouth to the time it goes out of your body, all right? A lot of people, they don't have that. Part of that is because they don't have the right microbiota uh, in their, they don't have the right flora in their system, okay? So, when you are moving your bowels two to three times a day, the toilet paper should stay clean. Why is that? Because you've had your enzyme therapy, your enzyme is breaking down your food, all of your nutrition is being absorbed into the bloodstream, and the only thing that's moving through the large intestine is waste products that nobody can do anything with, right? So look at your animals, look at your dog, look at your cat, look at your horse, look at your cows, right? They don't need toilet paper. Why is that? Because they eat mostly a raw diet. Well, maybe not your dog and your cat, but your cows and your, your horses do. And so they absorb all of their nutrition because your raw foods have their own enzymes in there. So we want to make sure that we've got that 18 to 24 hour bowel transit time. And we want to make sure that we're doing that enzyme therapy so that we're getting all of the nutrition absorbed into the body so there's no negative metabolites in the large intestine that is going to cause that inflammatory response, which leads to colorectal cancer, all right? The Mediterranean diet consists mainly of fruits, vegetables, high quality fats, and high quality protein can reduce the incidence of colorectal cancer. One of the reasons is that the Mediterranean diet can increase the good bacteria in the gut, cultivating a healthy gut microbiome, all right? The doctor says that it can take up to half a year for people who have a poor gut microbiome to feel the improvement after switching to the Mediterranean diet. In addition, he said it is not recommended for this group of people to consume large, high-fiber foods all at once, okay? And this is true. We don't recommend that, although we do like high-fiber foods. If you've got all kinds of yuck going on in your gut and you do a lot of high-fiber foods, you're going to irritate, further irritate your gut and you're not going to feel very well. Now, when you come and see me and we take photos of your eyes, we're looking at the bowel, okay, because you can see your, your colon in your eye. I know you didn't know that, but you can. And a lot of times people come in and when we look at that eye, we look at where that bowel is in the eye and it's very, very inflamed. And so we know when we see that in the eye that we have to do a lot of gut issues because we've got some problems there. The second thing that you can do is take good quality probiotics. Now there's probiotics everywhere and they are not created equal. We use transformation enzymes, probiotics. Why is that? Because that is their only job is to do enzymes. They're clean, they're pure, they are the way the body needs them to be to establish or reestablish a good uh, microbiome in the small intestine and large intestine. So remember what we said about good oral hygiene, that the bacteria in your mouth moves through the GI system because we, we are broken down in there and it gets in the bowel and this is what the tumors are made out of and the fecal matter has that E. coli in there, okay? So oral health is an important part of human health in general. We have a doctor, I can't remember his name, I, I think it's Dr. Pop, ancient guy, not ancient, but you know, he's not alive anymore. But he would say that 85% of all health conditions are connected to the bacteria in your mouth. So good oral hygiene is really, really, really important, all right? It is difficult to suppress the gingivitis uh, bacteria that is relying on good intestinal bacteria alone. It's also necessary to maintain your oral hygiene. The doctor suggests that we carry dental floss with us and use it between meals because it helps remove the sediment that the bacteria feeds on and to get a dental checkup every six months. And I think all of us know that. There is a bath brushing technique that is currently recognized as the most effective way of cleaning your teeth, and that is holding your brush 
at a 45 degree angle to your gum line so it can get rid of all of that bacteria on the gut line, okay? Gum line, sorry about that. Um, so, oral hygiene, if you just go to the dentist, get your teeth cleaned on a regular basis, you're going to cut your risk of colon cancer. So, all of these are things that we can do. We can change our food, we can add good probiotics, and we can clean our teeth better and more often, right? That is so, so easy. Colorectal cancer is the number three cancer here. Uh, I think it said worldwide. I said United States, but it's actually worldwide. That is a big deal. And if we can change our food, change our probiotics, or add probiotics, make sure we're getting the good ones, and just make sure our teeth are good, we're golden girls, okay? And guys, so let's do that. It's an easy thing to do. Remember, colon cancer is only tied to genetics 12 to 35 percent. A good deal of that is what we do, what we eat, how we live, all the things that we put into our system and, and all of that. So I'm going to leave you with that thought. Take care of yourself. It is the weekend. We want you to do a lot of self-care and I will see you back next week. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for commenting. Thank you for uh, liking all, all the things because it tells Facebook that we uh, bring value to the community and that's what we want to do. That's our stated mission and I will see you.